we are moving forward there is some changes in the program uh, basically earlier we have a discussion panel 3 but this uh, discussion panel we shifted to the afternoon so uh, and we replace it by the keynote speaker 7 uh, who is uh, come from the far away from Canada. So I just before uh, calling him, I just want to give a brief introduction about him. So uh, Prof. Stanford Blade is going to talk today about the agriculture biomass towards a circular economy. What just he asked the question by Ramsey. So uh, he is a Canadian agronomist and academic ad administrator. And he is also the Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. And Professor Blad is a full professor in the Faculty Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Science. And he has published around 100 articles, 10 book chapters, and he has attended uh, more than 170 conferences and he also edited a few books. And Dr. Blade is a member of several professional society uh, uh, and international committee, and he is also served as editorial board members in uh, several journals. And he has educational qualification. He done the BSc in genetics, and he obtained his master crop science from the university uh, uh, for, uh, in the topic on the breeding phys uh, physiology on the weed. And Professor Blas's doctorate was awarded by Maghill University in pla uh, plant breeding farming system. So I call the Prof. Blade to please come on the stage and give his keynote talk. You want the mic or you want the I'll do it here, I think. Salam alaikum. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I would just like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to come and speak to you. Congratulations on a remarkable research conference. And also to congratulate the organizers of the International Fair. Uh, it was quite impressive to see the turnout last night and the appearance of the minister, of course, was quite extraordinary. And I think I also have to congratulate our host country uh, for being awarded Expo 2030 this week as well. It's been a very good uh, week for uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I very much appreciate the uh, uh, introduction. I'm going to give a few opinions, so I just want to remind you of the work that I've done over the last 20 or 30 years. I've worked internationally in the CG system, the FAO system, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm a plant breeder. I feel like I'm amongst many chemical engineers, so you people speak a different language than I do. So uh, it's uh, good to hear some of the things, and I've learned a great deal over the sessions uh, uh, that I have participated in. I've been a CEO of an investment fund that was funding research in ag and food and forestry and the bioeconomy. And for the last 10 years, I've had the good fortune of being the dean of a faculty at the University of Alberta. I don't usually do a geography lesson, but I think it's important for the context of my talk today. I come from the province of Alberta in Western Canada, and you can see the leading industry sectors in our province. Our province has a small population of four million people, but we produce now almost three million barrels a day of oil equivalent. We have a large oil sands facility in northern Alberta, so we produce a lot of energy that we export to the rest of the world. We have a relatively small size. You can see that our province is a quarter of the size of Saudi Arabia, but there is a theme here that perhaps you can appreciate when you have a jurisdiction that produces a lot of conventional energy, people ask questions about the bioeconomy. Why should we even be concerned or interested in the bioeconomy? Just a short observation about our university, a world globally top-ranked university that's based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, in the, in the capital city of Alberta. Um, a comprehensive university. This year we will have 44,000 students we're moving to grow to 60,000 students, and you can see how important it is to have a significant number of international students as well within our faculty. I think we have faculty from almost 110 different countries from around the world. And I needn't tell you because you understand this, but for a broader uh, uh, constituency, the university is an engine of economic development, and the key number here is over $600 million 
of research funding that drives everything that we do. Just as in your universities, in your institutions, in the National Center, that innovation is what drives the economic opportunity of the future. So I'll talk just a little bit about uh, our faculty. Our faculty is very involved in the bioeconomy, but we're also very involved in the other activities of our province, not only in energy, but we have very strong production in agriculture. I'll show you a few statistics. We have a very active forest sector. And of course, we're trying to work that expertise into developing the bioeconomy in our province. So just a little sense of my faculty that I have the great privilege of serving as dean. We have an extensive number of undergraduate programs that cover all of the elements of agriculture, of food, of forestry. And more and more, again, you can see the importance of international graduate students of the innovative work that we do across our province, within the borders of Canada, and beyond Canada. We also have a great um, opportunity within our faculty. We have almost 10,000 hectares of research farms and ranches. Alberta works on extensive agriculture. We have significant herds of cattle, of beef cattle, to do research in genomics and other work. So not only are, do we focus on teaching, developing great programs for our students, but also to have a very research-intensive faculty that focuses on the opportunities in the bioeconomy, but of course in ag and food and forestry as well. Just to give you a sense, there's a lot of uh, a very fashionable term these days of being transdisciplinary. And I only just raise our departments to remind you, because I've been seeing the same thing happening in your organizations, it's not enough to just have one discipline. So in our case, we have a department that's very focused on all of the biological opportunities in agriculture. We have a group that also focuses on aspects of the environmental sciences and forestry and the work that goes on there. But we also have a department that looks at the economics of this work and how all of these things will fit together. So just a quick snapshot of Alberta, of where we fit this energy-rich province, but we're also thinking about all the other opportunities that are going on. Now, we've already heard in this conference the broader context. Of course, agriculture and food are in the news these days, whether it's geopolitics or inflation, the COP, 28 work talking about the sustainability of the food secure systems across the world. All of these things are the context for how we need to think about the bioeconomy. But we have this rather strange uh, juxtaposition. Whether we think about food or we think about biomass, we're trying to increase the resources availability to a population that's going to grow to 9 billion and beyond but we also want to move that target towards net zero carbon for all the reasons that we're all very aware of. So that becomes a bit of a, perhaps, a contradiction, but it's something that I've already heard in this conference, and just even hearing uh, Professor Belgesom's talk this morning, the first talk, to start thinking about how we change our viewpoint, how we change our lens to use biomass, to use bioproducts in a different way to address some of these issues. So I'm going to give you a perspective from my jurisdiction of why we invest in the bioeconomy. We are driven by the agriculture and food sector. We're driven by forestry. They produce billions of dollars a year for us. But we are based on commodity prices. Many times those prices on a global basis start to go down and some of our very long-term uh, industries start to look at other ways that they might be able to generate revenue. You can see the list there. What fits for you in a date palm context? Certainly thinking about climate change and moving towards net zero. I'll give you one example from Alberta that was purely driven by a unique technology breakthrough that developed a tremendous opportunity for value addition. So sometimes innovation is the thing that actually makes things work. So, um, I think all of us in our various locations here across this region, thinking about date palm, or in our particular case, we have to understand why we're doing what it is that we're doing. Is it because we have 800,000 tons of date palm biomass? Is, is that the driver? Or do we think on the other side to what are those products, what are those uh, unique processes that are actually going to create value 
for the citizens of this country and across the region. So that was the why, but what is the how? In the case of Alberta, and even I will speak more broadly about Canada, it's thinking about a comparative advantage. You've already talked about the fact that you have this large amount of biomass, those 800,000 tons, to start thinking about how that might fit with other areas. I was fascinated yesterday by the discussion about uh, the comparison to forest industries in other parts of the world. We are part of that other part of the world that has significant amount of forest biomass. How does date palm fit into that? And of course, you can see the other things that are so obvious. Once you start to get companies investing, once you start to be able to build on that early success of companies that are starting to make money, that becomes a, a very powerful motivator to grow the bioeconomy. So let's just talk about the steps that we've seen in Canada. And again, I'll just invite you to compare with what you're currently doing in the entire date palm value-added sector, that entire uh, supply chain. In the case of Canada, we did a great deal of research over decades in all of the biomass that we do. Just as in this conference, I've been so impressed by the work that's going on in characterizing materials and starting to look at other opportunities. But in the case of Canada, I don't know about here, everything started to come together and coalesce when we started to create a national strategy. And you can see some of the points there of actually connecting industry to government policy to have some very clear outcomes about how we want to use biomass to set some financial targets as well. All of these things started to come into play. The second point is that we have to understand how much biomass we have. And again, you've clearly provided in even just the previous uh, presentation uh, uh, from the National Center, and I, I thank the, the CEO. You clearly have a good idea about the amount of biomass that you have. In our case, in Alberta, we have a lot of forest biomass, and on the right-hand side, the chart is not important as far as uh, uh, the y-axis. I can just tell you that the calculation in Alberta is that we can harvest 25 million cubic meters of wood from our forests sustainably every year. We have about 100 million, uh, uh, well, let's call it hectares, 40 million hectares of forest, and we know how much, for, how much of that wood that we can collect on an annual basis so that the forest can remain sustainable. So that's important because when companies start to think about investing in using biomass, they need to go to the bank in many cases. They need to be able to show that they're going to have a supply for 20 years. I know this audience already understands that the capex for a biorefinery, the, the capital expenditure, can be hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you don't know what your biomass availability is, and if you do not have a very specific set of, uh, of uh, targets as to what availability is going to be over an extended period of time, you're going to get into some difficulty. In the same way in our province, we also have a very active agricultural sector. But again, I've told you that prices can go up and down, but it means that some of the co-products, I also enjoyed the discussion yesterday about whether things are waste or byproducts or co-products, we produce a lot of these products that we send around the world, but there are also co-products that are available that we can incorporate into bioeconomy products. So it gives us uh, some advantages when we have both forestry and agriculture of various sorts. I would just identify beef. We're the number one producer of, of, uh, of livestock, of beef in, the, in uh, Canada, within our province. But of course, even there, there are things like uh, uh, animal tallow and other things that are processed. You might have heard about Richard Branson flying across the Atlantic from London to New York last week using biofuel as the exclusive fuel within uh, a jet airliner. All of these things come together, not only in our traditional legacy industries, but how we can turn these things into bioeconomy opportunities. And I've already given you a little bit of a hint about how we measure ourselves as to whether or not we're being successful in establishing the bioeconomy. To be able to understand the availability of our feedstocks, to make sure that both the private sector and the public sector, government policy align on how we're going to build the bioeconomy, unique facilities, new conversion techniques, and then seeing how communities, producers, even small uh, towns and villages and cities, how they get involved in supporting the bioeconomy, all of those things come into play. 
Some of this is around unique facilities, and I've really enjoyed the talks uh, uh, around uh, uh, nanotechnology when it comes to cellulose nanocrystals or even uh, uh, CNF uh, nanofibers. We also have done a lot of work in this area, just as you have had, and the science here is extraordinarily good. I only put this um, facility up because it's, it was important for us, once we did that research, to be able, and I just had a, call, a, a discussion with my colleague from Morocco, but what does industry want? Just as was just mentioned, they want a kilo to start to develop their products, or they want 10 kilos, or they want 100 kilos of, of uh, cellulose nanocrystals. We have to be able to generate that so we can work with our industry partners. It's not sometimes good enough to just bring them a test tube of material, and things like a pilot scale process to produce uh, nanofibers or nanocrystals gave us a real opportunity to engage our industry partners. In the same way, there are new innovative technologies. This is a spin-off company from our faculty. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting group that takes vegetable oils and turns it into Jet A1 fuel. So we've seen investments from Shell, from Lockheed Martin, because of course those companies are looking for the newest, most innovative technologies in how to drive one of the largest users right now of petroleum-based jet fuels. So to be able to produce Jet A1 fuel coming from a technology originally uh, developed within our faculty uh, all of a sudden captures the interest. This is a pilot scale plant. The uh, company is now looking for support to produce uh, a large commercial plant, like a billion liters of biofuel, um, and I think it's gonna happen in the next three to five years. I know you won't want to hear this, but I'm just going to talk for one slide about the forest sector. The one area that we've seen the most biorefineries, by definition, in our province is in the forestry sector. That forest sector just used to produce solid wood and pulp and paper. And now you can just see a couple of the uh, uh, websites or even some of the news announcements. Our forest companies now are producing biomethanol almost, uh, in the case of Alberta Pacific, almost uh, 2,000 tons of biomethanol to be used in industrial processes to replace other ways that methanol has been produced in the past. And the bottom slide is talking about a new waste recovery, really it's a, a, a lignin recovery, to replace using the binding materials for construction, particle boards and others, instead of using petroleum-based products to bind together those construction materials, now to use lignin-based materials to do the same sorts of things. So de facto, we have biorefineries in place. Right now, they are being run from forestry biomass, and those companies are creating new value beyond those legacy products that I mentioned. And I tease this a little bit, so I know that this can't happen a lot, but I've already seen in some of the presentations yesterday how to find those very high-value opportunities. So in this case, this is a company, again, that was a spin-off from research done in our faculty that takes one molecule out of oats, the crop that you might be familiar with, uh, a molecule in uh, evinanthermide that's very useful in the cosmetics industry, uh, in the personal care industry. They pull that molecule out using a, a, a very specialized technique, and they ship this high-value material that's worth thousands of dollars a kilogram from the factory that you see here based in the capital city where our university is to the rest of the world. And why did that happen? Because there was uh, a graduate student working uh, within our faculty with someone that was very involved with supercritical extraction. And they started to realize that there might be very specific ways that they could get this very valuable molecule isolated in a way that no one else had been able to do. And now that's led to the building of a factory of employing, I think it's over uh, 100 people now in this factory, and the graduate student that worked on this particular process is now the chief scientist for CPRO for this company. So I've told you everything from the scale of forestry companies producing thousands of tons of biomethanol, all the way through to the other side of a company that's making a remarkable revenue uh, uh, stream from a much smaller volume, but because of the value, they also are seeing a great deal of economic benefit. I'm just gonna end by talking about things that maybe don't immediately reference date palm, but it's things that we are investing in. You would know of the interest in plant protein as people start to think about maybe moving away or taking the choice to not always use livestock of animal protein. 
Of course, I've told you that we produce a lot of beef in our province, but we're also working on how you can extract protein out to make all kinds of delightful food products based on plant protein. We are hiring our first person right now in cellular agriculture, so that's precision fermentation. So in case you're looking for a particular, uh, what used to be a dairy protein, now you can actually produce that in a 1,500 or a 3,000 liter uh, a fermentation facility because certain parts of, of the citizens across the world want to be able to use material that is not generated from animals. Within the University of Alberta, we, my president would not allow me to do, give this talk if we didn't also say that uh, our university is ranked third in the world in machine learning in that part of artificial intelligence. A few months ago, it was just announced that we're hiring another 20 researchers in this area. Our faculty will benefit from this. And I guess it would be a challenge to you, and I've already heard a little bit of the work that's going on around artificial intelligence. How can you use some of these new technologies to characterize the distribution of your feedstock across the region? What are those other data sets that are available that can be interrogated in ways that we couldn't have dreamed of five years ago that those technologies are now available? And I guess I would just finish off, this is a food slide showing the way that uh, uh, Canada has responded to opportunities in the global food markets, but I think we also have to be ready to be able to respond to those green economy opportunities that we heard from Professor Belgium in the opening uh, uh, talk this morning. So I'll just uh, finish off by saying that our university is very focused on thinking about the sustainable development go goals, the Times Higher Education Group just uh, uh, last year named us as seventh in the world in working towards this kind of activity, not only in the research that we do, but the way that our university operates. So we are very proud of that. And I would just uh, say that uh, maybe to conclude, we're thinking a lot about innovation in Alberta, not only in our legacy industries that I've described to you, but also how we can work through the bioeconomy. I've seen very clearly during this conference that you're also thinking the same way. How can you use those innovative ideas to actually have opportunities to have that uh, research, that those insights actually implemented in commercial opportunities that will lead to new and different revenue sources? That's certainly something that we're thinking about as well. So I very much appreciate your attention and I look forward to any questions or if you'd like to contact me, I will be around for the rest of the day as well. Thank you very much for your attention. If any questions, you can uh, disturb him. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Please give the mic. Very good presentation. That was fun. Uh, thank you for uh, the very nice presentation uh, about the University of Alberta. Uh, I want to ask about is there any cooperation between the university and uh, academic sectors uh, in this area? That's the first question. Uh, Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so was it specifically in Saudi Arabia or more broadly? Yeah, yeah in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I would also like to introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Dan Frederick, is also here from the university's international office. We're going to be having a series of meetings over the next number of days. I know that we're meeting with uh, Salik, the, the livestock group uh, here in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, and we're certainly talking to a number of groups as well. We have a number of students that come to our university uh, from Saudi Arabia. I, I see some students in the background there. Uh, you have amazing educational uh, groups here uh, uh, across the region, but if you want to do a, a master's or a PhD, of course, you'd always be welcome to come to the University of Alberta. Uh, we very much uh, uh, emphasize our international col uh, collaborations, and that's certainly one of the intents that we want to do uh, in this visit as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second question is related to uh, some concerns about using foods in biofuel, for example. Can you enlighten us on this subject? Yes, uh, so th thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, I'm sure people heard, but this idea of fuel versus food, um, you know, obviously that discussion was ha happening almost a decade ago already. Um, I would say within a Canadian context, uh, we've moved on because most of the kinds of work that we're talking about are using uh, co-products that wouldn't necessarily be going into the food stream for the work that we do. Um, and I grew up on a farm. Uh, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather were farmers. If I look at this from the perspective of a farmer, of a producer, 
um, it's attractive to be able to sell to people that are producing food or maybe those that are producing fuel. So I understand in an era of food security that we need to be very careful about this topic. Uh, but for producers, I think it's interesting that maybe the price for their product might be higher because uh, these various industries are competing with them. Uh, but I think we need to be very careful about making sure that food security is uh, highlighted, not only in our parts of the world, but other parts as well. I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. There is one question from that. Can you give the mic there? Thank you, Dr. Abdullah Hamdan. He's a distinguished professor in agriculture engineering, so uh -huh. <laughs> uh, date and uh, food processing. Uh, we, uh, uh, my name is uh, Saleh Al Ghamdia, chair of uh, agriculture uh, engineering department. Um, on uh, behalf of the dean of uh, Agri food and agriculture uh, science uh, college, uh, we would like to sit with you uh, uh, further and see where the. Uh, there is an opportunity to explore with the University of Alberta. I, for one, benefited from University of Alberta of a microbial strain that only oh. founded in University of Alberta and Germany. So oh. in my PhD, uh, I was in Washington State. I collaborated with uh, University of Alberta. So we welcome you to King, uh, uh, King Saud University. Mm. We welcome to you uh, to Saudi Arabia. Thank That's you. very kind. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I appreciate the observation. I'm also very pleased. This is the beautiful thing about science, that level of collaboration to uh, share materials, to make progress. Uh, and we very much would welcome uh, the opportunity to discuss further uh, uh, with your university. I was very impressed by the booth that you have and the range of research that is going on. So uh, we will talk after the session. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very, very nice and complete uh, presentation. Thank you very much for the citations. Uh, I just would like to have uh, not really a question, but uh, just uh, uh, an addition to uh, you, you touch the what we call nano cellulose and so on, and uh, uh, the arising questions which are around them. Uh, we have a very, very close collaboration with most of the paper makers and uh, what we uh, feel is and what we see is uh, of course when you ask people which nanocellulose is available in the market then they will tell you okay cellulose for these uh, nanocrystals and so on but something which is extremely interesting nanocellulose today is produced practically everywhere where you have a paper making yes. tools but they are used internally. Mm. See, not, they are not commercial product mm. because they are, not, they are not selling it, they are using it, but for their purpose, especially for very light papers and so on, they use a lot, mm. both for mechanical properties, barrier, and, and so on. So uh, it means that this, what we call today nano silos, which is supposed to be very, very expensive, uh, difficult to reach, difficult to have, is practically an industrial commodity. Mm. That's, uh, I appreciate that observation. Maybe we need to talk more, but as you know, some of the uh, commercial producers, uh, Cellulforce you've already talked about, they would argue that they are not doing very well economically. So we'll have to maybe talk about the reasons uh, for that, but I absolutely accept your point. The groups that are already using find it to a great benefit for, uh, uh, certainly in the paper industry and, and others as well for that internal use. So uh, thank you for the, for the observation. Any other question? Very good. We have ample of time for questions. <laughs> so I, if you want to do, yeah, there's one question is coming from back. Yes, thank you for, for this uh, valuable presentation. Uh, do you think that uh, at the current situation at the farm level and farming of dates in the country, uh, how, how much do we work to prepare ourselves to the, to the next step, to the gates of this new technology? 
for example, uh, can we make small plants for uh, for each farm, or we have to aggregate all of these by byproducts, and then we may uh, start with uh, any type of uh, new technology? Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Uh, I, I think that this has been one of the biggest issues. Uh, uh, and it, I, I meant to mention it, but you've given me the ideal opportunity. There's a reason why the forest sector is moving more quickly in Canada around the bioeconomy, because they already have large amounts of fiber. They're very good at organizing fiber collection uh, so that they can run it through their various facilities. Um, when we have uh, activities like use of agricultural straw, maybe from wheat or from barley to make into particle board for construction, you have to organize 500 producers, maybe 1,000 producers to get to the, you know, maybe the, the, the hundreds of thousands of tons that you need to run a facility. So I wish I had a very positive answer, but I think for the agricultural community, uh, it's challenging to be able to put together the kinds of volumes that people are looking for. And even when I think about the 800,000 tons that are talked about in date palm, if this is spread across a wide region, if the density of that material makes it difficult or more expensive to transport, all of these things dictate against uh, uh, these kind of bioeconomic opportunities. Where we do see that producers are coming together is on the input side. So in our case, crop producers uh, come together, maybe 100 or 200. And remember, most of the farms in Alberta, I think the average now is almost 1,000 hectares for each individual farm. But those farmers are coming together to buy fertilizer in bulk, to, to buy other crop inputs in bulk. So they're trying to decrease their costs on the input side, uh, on the cost side. But it's much more difficult to do the kind of thing that you've said at the revenue side. So uh, it's an ongoing issue that, uh, that people need to be thinking about. Thank you. So I think, uh, any other questions? Yeah, one more. Thank you, doctor, for your nice presentation. We already fly to you to Canada. Good. And now I want to ask a, a quick question. I, wrote, I want to uh, take a, a small brief about the plant biotechnology in your uh, university. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, so the question was around the biotechnology aspect? Plant biotechnology. Uh, ah, okay. Thank you. So, uh, you know, clearly the tools that are available. So I'm trained as a plant breeder. I was trained 1,000 years ago. When I look at the plant breeders now, so we have breeding programs in wheat and in canola, the rapeseed, uh, uh, sometimes uh, that people would know, uh, the oilseed uh, crop that's now growing on millions of hectares across Western Canada. Uh, and we're using all of these tools. You will know that there's been a lot of transgenic work that's gone on in a number of crops. This has certainly happened in the case of canola. It started from, of course, herbicide tolerance, but now we're starting to see um, improvements in the oil quality, the health of things like uh, canola, the, the, the rapeseed that people are familiar with uh, in Europe. Um, uh, and we continue to hire new people because this area is expanding so quickly in the technology possibility. And in this case, we do not work by ourselves. We collaborate with many of the global multinational companies because they also are making investments in these areas. So um, it, it's, it's every area from uh, understanding the genomics. We do work both in plants, as, as you've asked about, but we're also leaders in animal genomics as well. So starting to understand the functional genomics of animals and crops, and then starting to incorporate that into our breeding programs, which goes directly to the availability of producers because when they buy those genetics that have increased yield, that have reduced uh, issues around insect attack or disease attack, that's good news for farmers uh, as well. Thank you for the question. There are a lot of students are also uh, sitting here. If you want to ask any question, please ask, you know. This is a good opportunity for you to get the, you know, the, on this platform. If you have a curiosity, please ask any question. And this is the last question I'm taking. <laughs> Nobody dare to ask the question? We will talk later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, good. Thank you for the great presentation. 
Uh, I come from the Saudi Investment Recycling Company, uh, and I would like to ask about uh, the initiatives or the startup spin-off from the university that is related to recycling and waste management and circular economy. Uh, that's an interesting question. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate uh, the observation. Uh, so our city, uh, the, uh, uh, where the University of Alberta is based, uh, the capital of Alberta, Edmonton, has been very involved in thinking about uh, different ways of uh, both recycling but also using uh, what would usually be sent to the landfill. There are a number of new technologies that are being used. Um, so the, there's a great deal of activity. We could talk about this uh, uh, later, but uh, uh, I think in the city of Edmonton, uh, they've reduced the amount of material that actually goes to the landfill by almost 60% because of some of the new technologies that are being used. Uh, so this is very much uh, something that people are working on, but I'd be happy to, to discuss further as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'll share my contact and okay. we can set up a meeting later on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Now I call, you, you just have a